In some villages in Africa, groups of orphans gather together to form their own families. They come together to build each other houses out of the mud until every one of them has a home. This is what community looks like. This is the church in action, and we get a chance to live that life. Come get your hands dirty. If you were a little bird, and you had the opportunity to fly around this church every Tuesday, you would see that we have a worship team that meets up on the fifth floor. And it's a worship team from both campuses. The creative team meets early in the morning, and then more staff members come in later in the afternoon, and they help us tend to all the details of our worship services. We spend lots and lots of time planning each service, working out each detail so that they will speak to all of us and draw us closer to Jesus. The creative team is much smaller in number, and honestly, we're probably not all that creative. We're trying to learn to be more imaginative so it will help us with our preaching and our teaching. Pastor Andy led the very first creative team, and he had us watch a TED Talk, a video, about being aware of all of our surroundings and how when you look at those different things, you can add those senses into your teaching and your sermons. I told you a couple weeks back that I had the opportunity to go into a church in Spain and I went underground where the original church from the 400s was. I was standing below the church and the Catholic church was rebuilt and built above it. And there was a hole in the ceiling. I could see the priest. I could hear him do communion and sing. I could look at the artwork underneath the church and see the graves of all the people. And I could look up through the hole and see the magnificent artwork. It was sensory overload of the best kind. Well, Reverend Caitlin Bowie Hankins did our second session of the creative team. And Caitlin loves to go deep. And so she worked with each one of us to help us figure out our own creative styles. I had the third week, and I decided, decided to cut to the chase and hone in on our new message series, Dust. And I have a slash beside it, or dirt. The instances or references to dust and dirt in the Bible are absolutely everywhere. Jesus walked in the dust as he moved around. He drew a line in the dust and the si uh, sand with the adulterous woman. Not only that, he got dirt and dust and put it together and healed a blind man. And something that I've never ever thought about before was there was more than likely dust in the new tomb where they laid Jesus because it was hollowed out limestone. And surely they could not get all of the dust out of it. So it was my turn, and the very first question I asked the creative team was, tell me a time when you were the most physically dirty the most physically dirty, and they all started laughing. I wanted to demonstrate 
So what I did was I wrapped myself up in an old sheet and I wrapped it all over my body. And then I put on a hat and then I put on sunglasses like this. I was totally wrapped from head to toe. And I told him about the time that I was in Haiti in an open truck and we had to drive up a mountain. It hadn't rained in months and the caliche or the ground up shells, it was thick. And so every time the truck would move, all of that caliche just went all over us. Actually, wrapping up didn't do anything. It snuck behind our glasses. It covered our tennis shoes. If you had dark hair and any of it was exposed, it turned solid white. Well, once we got up the mountain, we had to walk around a village. And honestly, it was a farm village, and we stepped in some things that we probably shouldn't have. Not only that, we drank lots and lots of water. You need to do that in Haiti to stay hydrated. And there came a point where everybody was looking at me and saying, we have to go to the bathroom. And so I asked our interpreter, I said, what do we do? He goes, no problem. I'll take you out to our school and you can use the facilities there. Folks, you know the marble bathrooms that we have and the beautiful thing that you just put your hands under and it dries them? No, 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 no. These were outdoor bathrooms and you could get about 10 feet from them and you could smell them. We had to make a decision. Do we go in or do we not go in? And we held our breath and we went in. And when we came out, we felt like the stench had just covered our clothes. If that wasn't bad enough, we had to go back down the mountain through all the caliche again. And when we got to the Mission of Hope, we just took off running as fast as we could go, and we jumped in the showers, and the cool Haitian water made us clean again. We were like totally different looking people. Now, my second question didn't need any props. I simply asked them, when were you the most spiritually dirty? When were you the most spiritually dirty? Once again, I went first, and I told them the story of when I was a young adult and I had wandered away from God. And I told them that whenever I sing the hymn on page 400 of your pew Bible, Come Thou Font of every, every Blessing, I have to fight back the tears. Listen to this. Jesus sought me when a stranger wandering from the fold of God. He to rescue me from danger interposed his precious blood. Here's my favorite. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart. Oh, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. When I sing that, I even realize today how easy it is for all of us to wander away from God. After my story, the team opened up and they told their stories of when they felt the most spiritually dirty. And it was heartbreaking to hear how many of those stories came from the college years. I have a theory. I think the devil sets a trap for our young, naive uh, youngsters going off, off to college. And I think if you are a mother or a grandmother or grandfather or you have any children around you, Train them up before they go so that the scriptures will be up in their hearts. The good news is Jesus is always with them. So I want to ask you the same question today. When were you the most physically dirty? Was it in a game of football? 
Was it on a mission trip? Was it mowing your yard and digging in the dust and the dirt? Is it like on America's Funniest Videos when somebody falls in a mud hole and all you can see is the whites of their eyes? When have you been the most physically dirty? More important, when have you been the most spiritually dirty? Was it from something in the past that you finally let go of? Or is it something you are battling right this moment? Something you can't master? The scripture I read from Matthew chapter 6 is a part of the Sermon on the Mount. And that's the most famous sermon that Jesus ever gave. If you look up to the three center windows, that's the Sermon on the Mount. And if you look closely, you will see all kinds of people sitting around Jesus. Some of them are listening. One has his hand like this. Some of them are flat out sleeping. There's a couple up there that have their head bowed, almost like they hear what Jesus is saying, but they don't know how to live it out. And if you look really closely, you'll find Judas lurking in the shadows. If I had to sum up the Sermon on the Mount, I would say this. The Sermon on the Mount is how to live a life that is dedicated and pleasing to God, free from hypocrisy, full of love and grace, full of wisdom and discernment. You know what? I want to live like that. Don't you? Wouldn't you like to live like that too? But as I look back through Matthew's gospel from chapter 5 to 7, Jesus begins to list all these things. He said, you have heard it said, but I say, and then he talks about adultery, divorce, oath, love for enemies or not loving our enemies, anger, judging, and more and more. And you know what? I want to be pure. I want to do all those things right. But like you, I struggle. In Romans chapter 7, verse 19, Paul, of all people, said this, I want to do what is good, but I don't. I want to do, I don't want to do what is wrong, but I do it anyway. A while back, a man walked into a bar and he ordered a beer. As soon as he got it in his hand, he took it and threw the liquid in the bartender's face. Then he grabbed a napkin and went over and started wiping it off of the bartender. And the bartender said, why in the world did you do that to me? He says, I have a compulsion. I cannot make myself stop. I try to fight it off, and I don't know what to do. And the bartender said, I am never, ever going to serve you again until you get help. Two months passed by. The guy came back in, and he ordered a beer. And the bartender said, I am not serving you. I know you. And he goes, whoa, 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 wait. I went to see a psychiatrist. I'm okay now. It's okay to serve me. And so the bartender thought, well, I did tell him to get help. He gave him a beer, and immediately the man threw the beer in his face. And the bartender said, I thought you were cured. And the man said, I am. I still do it, but I don't feel guilty anymore. Isn't it easy to arrive at a place where we just live out our sins and we don't even feel guilty about them anymore? They're just like a part of our lives. That's why Lent and all the things we sang today that Terry put together for us is such an important time in the church. To sum up Lent, it's a time to slow down 
focus on Jesus. It's a time of fasting, and it's a time of repentance and self-reflection. Many people give up something during Lent. Uh, you can either give it up, or sometimes they say you can add it. Well, I did both. I decided to write my husband a thank you note for all the wonderful things that he has done for me. I bought little cards, little heart-shaped cards, and I wrote, thank you for supporting me in the ministry. Thank you for taking care of our cars. Thank you for teaching our children strong moral principles. I added something, but I gave up something. You want to know what it is? NCIS. I love NCIS. My husband wants me to watch it with him, and I love Jethro. And so I decided I was going to give it up. He is horrified that I did it, but I thought, and you can go in your room and you can reread the book of Acts and not watch NCIS. <laughs> Pastor Andy added 40 cups of coffee to 40 people who don't know him, and he's almost met his goal. So we get ashes. I told you about ashes early on, and that's to say, I'm a Christian, and I am sorry for the things that I have done. And today, during the last hymn, if you didn't get your ashes, you can come down and kneel or stand at the altar or raise up your hand and Crystal will come and assist you. But I think it's important that each one of us go through the Lenten time together, not just some of us. We need to be together as we move towards the cross. You're going to have opportunities for Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, Easter Sunday at both of our campuses. And I encourage you, go ahead. Make room in your schedule to walk to the cross together. Now, going back to the text one more time, Jesus is saying, don't sound the trumpet when you give. Do it in secret. When you pray, don't stand out on the street corner and just yell out your prayers. Do it in secret. When you fast, don't just make a huge deal out of it. Just do it where Jesus will see you. He's saying, hey, don't do anything for your own gain. He said, don't try to look good in front of others. And then he says something interesting. That is your reward. That is your only reward, that you will have the admiration of others. What Jesus wants is a heart that is fully focused on him. That is where the real reward comes in. I know it's hard. I know that all of us have done some of the things that I've mentioned before. How in the world can we get a hold of these things and conquer them? What can we do? How can we let go of those sins that are trapping us? Well, I have two suggestions for you today, and I'm actually doing them, so I'm trying something and telling you. Um, first of all, what we need to do is bring the thing that traps you the most to the forefront of your mind. Put it right in front of you. As I look back through all my journals and all the stuff I've written, there's one word that pops up every single time over and over, and it's the word busyness. I struggle with being busy all the time. Yes, my job for caring for the people that God entrusted me can be 24-7. Not only that, if I don't watch out, I'm going to rise up and I'm going to jump in my car and I'm going to take my prayers on the way. But that's not what Jesus wants. He wants my time. 
He wants my attention. He wants me to start the day with him. Isaiah 30, 15 says, Your strength will come from settling down in complete dependence on me. The only thing you've been unwilling to do. And then Jesus says, come with me to a quiet place. I just want to talk to you. So this Lent, I brought that sin up to the forefront of my mind. Not the whole list. That's overwhelming. I brought that one, and I'm going to choose to practice it and practice it and do what Jesus would have me do not what the world wants me to do or not what Anne wants me to do. How many of you have been watching the Winter Olympics? Raise your hand. Okay. You have seen how they show how the athletes practice and practice to master a feat that will make them a winner. That's what we have to do. We have to let go and practice the things that are God-honoring And when we do, the easier they become. You start with one, and you practice, and you master it. You practice. Bill Brady was the basketball star of the 1964 Olympics. Someone said to him, I wish I could shoot baskets like you. And he replied, would you stay in one place until you hit 24 consecutive baskets, practice makes perfect. That's what we've got to do with our sin. We practice mastering it every day, and soon we'll be a winner. And that's what we Methodists call going on to perfection. Now, there are some of you in this room who have walked with Jesus since you could even walk. And there are some of you in here who are fairly new to it. You may not know the sin that you want to put in front of God today to practice getting rid of it. And I say to you, think of what King David said. He said, search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Point out anything that offends you and lead me along the path of everlasting life. David opened himself up and said, Okay, God, anything I've done to offend you, you bring it to the forefront of my mind and I'm going to confess it. Did you know that works? All you have to do is say it. And it works. And all of a sudden, you will start having flashbacks of things that you did, and you will be able to confess them. Well, so if you confess them, where does sin go? You ever thought of that? Where does sin go? The prophet Micah says, God will take pity on us. He will tread our wrongdoing underfoot. He will cause all of our sins to go to the bottom of the sea. He tramples them underfoot, puts them in the deepest part of the sea, and listen to this, Hebrews 8.12, I will forgive them for the wicked things they did, and I will remember their sins no more. Why in the world would you go out and rent scuba dive equipment or a small submarine, and try to dive down where all this stuff is so you can feel guilty again. I'm going to tell you, you'll never find it. It's gone. It is gone. So, if Jesus is moving on, so should we. We need to let them go. When we are free of some of our sins, then we can live like that bumper video showed. We are so joyful that we can take the mud that has covered us and we can build something beautiful with it as they built a house. As I close today, I want to tell you a story that touched my heart. 
In 1995, Cal Ripken Jr. broke the baseball record that many believe could never ever be broken because Lou Gehrig had that Iron Man feat of playing in 2,131 consecutive games. Ripken gives much of the credit of his accomplishments to his dad and his teaching. Carl Ripken Sr. played minor league baseball and coached and managed the Orioles. During the 1996 season, the senior Ripken was inducted into the Orioles, Orioles Hall of Fame. And after he gave his acceptance speech, his son came up and wanted to talk about his dad. And he was talking about the book he wrote, The Only Way I Know. He said, it was so difficult to get up and talk about my dad. I wanted to say what my dad means to me. So he told a story about his two little children, Rachel, who was six, and also Ryan, who was two. And they had been bickering, bickering, bickering for two weeks. And one day, Rachel looked at the little boy and said, you're just trying to be like dad. And this, the junior, Ripken Jr., finally said, hey, what's so wrong with being like dad? And he said, when I finished telling the story, I looked at my dad and said, dad, that's always what I've tried to do. I want to be just like my dad. Look up there. Jesus' arms are up, and he's saying, Come, dear ones, come and be like me. Let's use this Lenten season to get rid of all of those sins that are burdening you. I'll wash them away. I'll trample them underfoot. I will cast them in the depths of the sea, and I will remember them no more. You have my word. Let's pray.